Uh, one of the things that I think is important to have um, when have in mind when you're reading Cisneros's works is one of her points about why it is that she writes and to take that question of why she writes and why people write. Um, I love this quote where she says, we do this because the world we live in is a house on fire and the people we love are burning. There's even um, a chapter in the House of Mongo Street where it's a chapter Minerva writes poems where she uses a similar phrase to that. And so it's that idea of urgency the urgency of the writing that she is doing and that she continues to do to use writing as a way of telling her story and getting others to tell their stories. Now, in saying that, what I also want you to realize is that some of the works that she writes, the tone expresses this urgency, but in others, it's sort of a almost quiet smoldering. It, it, it's the sense that um, like the main character in the House on Manga Street, Esperanza, there's this sense of waiting, right, and hoping, and that at some point you're pushed to move on from that. So here's an image from Cisneros. There are, she has a, a really lovely website with lots of amazing photos and um, personal information. There's a blog there where she's writing letters or postcards in response to others, including some responses to classroom business that she's done. So this is her with one of her many pets. Bit of background. So um, Cisneros, even though she's very much associated with Texas, she actually was born in Chicago and moved to Texas in the late 80s or in, in the 90s moved to San Antonio as a novelist as a poet as a teacher and especially as a philanthropist she's probably uh, the most one of the most important Mexican American writers um, that is continuing to write right now she's very much I think the writer you're going to find in text and textbooks uh, to speak to Mexican American and Latinx populations. And although I say that, uh, when I teach my class uh, to future teachers, and I ask this group every fall of about 25 students, most of them coming out of Texas high schools, who has read her work, it's usually only about half of them. And many of them didn't encounter her work until they got to the university. So I hope that continues to change, that programs like this encourage people to teach her work and to teach other works by Latinx literature. By Latinx writers. So she lived and worked in San Antonio, was very much a part of the San Antonio and the Texas literary scene. And a few years ago, she moved to Mexico to San Miguel and writes about that uh, and thinking about how she was pulled to that, um, to make that move. Her father what is, was Mexican, her mother was Mexican American. And so in a lot of her texts, you see that conflict between a Mexican upbringing and a Mexican American upbringing. And it's important to to think about that difference, even in places in House on Manga Street. As a philanthropist, she established the Macondo Foundation and the Alfred Cisneros de Moral Foundation. So uh, Macondo is, of course, the legendary city um, developed by Marquez in 100 Years of Solitude. And it's a term that she and other writers return to as sort of this place where um, you could imagine you could create your own world and create your own society, especially for writers. So when um, Cisneros won uh, one of the early, one of the MacArthur Fellowships, the Genius Grants, she used that money to set up the Macondo Foundation, which helps support. Uh, emerging writers every summer and gives them uh, mentorship to continue with their writing. Uh, she won the National Medal of Arts Award and last year the Penn Nabokov Award for International Literature. And I think that's important to think about her position as um, a Mexican American writer, an American writer, and an international writer. So in addition to the House on Manga Street, she has a collection of short stories called Woman Hollering Creek and Other Stories, a novel, Caramelo, collection of essays, A House of My Own, and some poetry collections as well. So this is the um, edition of The House of Manga Street. There are various editions to this. 
uh, this is the one that, that I utilize because it's the 25th anniversary edition. When the novel was first published in the 80s, it was published originally by Arte Publico Press in Houston. And then it was picked up by, um, may, by vintage uh, mainstream publisher um, in the late 80s and really contributed to um, its popularity, you know, being picked up by a mainstream writer and mainstream publisher and not a not just coming out of a small press allowed this book to, as she says, start to grow and spread. She said it was slow, but um, it had achieved the status so that on the 25th anniversary edition, she writes this beautiful essay that um, I shared with you as the preface, thinking about what she was doing um, at the time that she was writing this novel. So I shared with you an essay related to the novel where the author responds to a mother who was upset that this was a novel that they were teaching and having in the library at her daughter's school. And so Cisneros writes how it took her a few days to come up with a response that was not thought, was thoughtful and not angry. And so one of the paragraphs in there that I thought spoke to this idea of how literature can um, help us heal is this comparison she makes between books and medicine. I believe books are medicine. A library is a medicine cabinet. What can heal one person may not work for someone at all for somebody else. You know when something isn't healing you just as you know when something is. And if my book isn't doing the trick and doesn't serve you, you're not required to keep reading, but please allow it to remain on the library shelf for someone else who needs this particular medicine. And in thinking about who this book is meant for, she speaks in that letter about how, although it wasn't a book that she read, that she wrote for children to read, children do like to read it. Children do want to process those things. And so, one of the things that I always talk about with my teacher ed students is at what age do you introduce this? Most students read parts of it in middle school, sometimes fifth grade, and then read the novel later on in high school and talk much about their experience reading it at two different ages. I know that I come back to it every year and one of the things that's happened to me as I've read this book over and over again and taught it is that I'm really interested in the older characters in the book. I'm really interested in Esperanza's mother in the book because I'm a mother and I think a lot about her perspective, even though she's a minor character, but it's a good chance to talk to your students about where they are when they encounter a text and to think about their role as readers. Uh, this is, um, her collection of short stories, Woman Hollering Creek and other stories. The story 11 is from this. One of the things to think about um, in teaching one of these short stories is that the collection is presented into three different sections. And the first part of the section really speaks, I think, to adolescent um, to adolescents in the sense that they have the same tone as the house on Manga Street itself. Woman Hollering Creek, if you happen to be familiar with it, is a creek in Seguin that you pass when you're uh, driving on 10 from San Antonio to Houston. Uh, from Austin, you'd have to go a little bit south to cross it. And she takes the idea of Woman Hollering Creek and links it to the legend of La Llorona. So it's, it's a story that students really are interested in because of its sense of place and myth and what it speaks to in terms of the main characters um, living in that location. Uh, other books, Loose Woman is a collection of poetry. Uh, some poems in there, and I've listed some at the end, could be things you use with your class. The House of My Own, here's my copy, is a beautiful book. If you like books and like the materiality of books, it's beautiful, heavyweight pages, lots of color photos that you can vintage photos of Cisneros in there, and it collects her essays over the years. And this last one, Puro Amor, is um, a short chapbook in English and Spanish with line drawings 
about her pets. So kind of fun to bring um, to students as well and to think about Cisneros as a visual artist. So what I want to do today is focus on the following teaks. Um, and I think I pulled these from the level eight, eighth grade teaks in there. So to think about response skills um, in looking at literature, especially the personal connections to a variety of uh, sources, including self-selected text. So getting them to consider how they connect to the experiences that Cisnotos is writing about and how, as she says, it can help them begin to tell their own stories. And then, of course, related to authors, purpose and craft and thinking about audience, um, purpose, text structures, print and graphic features, some of those things that we will be talking about throughout the presentation today. Themes in all of her works, but especially in House on Mongo Street, identity formation as that comes through living a bicultural, multicultural existence, as I said, both thinking about herself, the characters as American and Mexican American, you have stories that go back to Mexico. And so that sense of being a Mexican American in Mexico, feeling like an outsider, you have issues of class, um, sexuality, especially an emerging sense of sexuality um, in a world where for the characters in House of Mongo, Mongo Street, that seems empowering and yet comes with its own sense of risk. Home and a sense of place, finding oneself within a home and creating a home for oneself, which comes through both rebellion and individualism. So in the House of My Own essay, in the 25th anniversary edition, she describes what it's like to be a writer at this time as she's trying to live it like a writer and has in her mind what other writers have done, mostly male writers, not coming from the same world as she is. And so she imagines that she's trying to live like a writer, even as she's in the progress of make, process of making that thing happen. And so that's a great essay, I think, to read in companion, in, in conjunction with the House on Mongo Street to get her own sense of what it is to be a writer and to do these stories, because that's Espinance's journey throughout the text. So for each of the texts that I um, have included, I've given you just a really brief summary um, of them and some themes to be thinking about, especially as they related to the general overview. But what I really want to look at is how we might move more specifically to some techniques that you can focus on in her work. So in the chapter, My Name, which is a chapter I gave you, she starts with a really powerful um, use of imagery and symbolism. In English, my name means hope. In Spanish, it means too many letters. It means sadness. It means waiting. It is like the number nine, a muddy color. It is the Mexican records my father plays on Sunday morning when he is shading songs like sobbing. When I teach House on Mongo Street, I often start with this chapter rather than the first chapter because I want them to think about the fact, one, we don't know Esperanza's name until we get to this chapter. And two, I feel like it's such a powerful way of looking at her language. So in presenting this whole chapter, which speaks to the history of her name and how that idea of waiting becomes a symbolic idea of it's not just my name, but I'm waiting for something to happen like so many of the women that I see. This particular opening helps set the tone for it. And so I usually do what I call a copy change of this where I ask students to take this paragraph and to rewrite it using their own name. And it becomes a chance for us to analyze the diction, um, the overall symbolism of the name, 
to think about imagery and it also becomes a chance for them to connect to it so when you go to breakout rooms at the end of this you'll have a chance to um, see how i do that exercise and maybe i don't know if you'll have enough time get a chance to practice it um, continuing with this chap chapter thinking about the idea of diction since I said she speaks to a multicultural existence, this is a place where she thinks about both English and Spanish, all right, that for her sister Magdalena, she comes home and she becomes nanny, but Esperanza is always Esperanza, even when, as she says, they can't say her name correctly at school. And that's a really powerful moment for many of my students um, to think about how their name has been pronounced at school or how it's been mispronounced. There's been a lot of discussion over the last few years about the importance of saying our students' names correctly. And I feel like this particular chapter really speaks to that. But when we talk about the last part of that, um, Esperanza as Lisandra or Maritza or Zizi the X, Zizi the X always gives a lot of discussion because there is this sense of mystery about it and the sense of the unknown. What is it that Esperanza wants to be? So this is a good chapter to think about these particular literary techniques. Um, symbolism and, let me move my zoom bar, point of view. So this is from the last chapter of the text. And one of the things that this last chapter does is it becomes full circle with the first chapter of this. It uses some of the same um, phrasing, the paragraph, we didn't always live on Mongo Street. But what I really want you to think about is how in the second paragraph, she has that first person point of view, but she also creates a third person point of view in describing herself as she. I make a story for my life for each step my brown shoe takes, I say. And so she trudged up the wooden stairs, her sad brown shoes taking her to the house she never liked. It's a good moment for them to think about the overall structure of the novel and to think about how she presents stories from her point of view and from other characters' points of view. Uh, style and tone. As I mentioned, the preface to this, A House of My Own, gives us much information to bring to our understanding of these chapters. Cisneros really does, as she say, experiments with the language. Certain chapters like Darius in the Clouds break sentences in unusual places. You'll notice that she doesn't use a lot of punctuation in terms of quotation marks. She breaks those rules to help create a particular, maybe more informal tone, but I think really a poetic tone. And that is important because it goes to how the writer creates her own story. And so using that can be a good way to introduce those things that when we teach poetry, I think it's clear by the way the poem looks, but when we're teaching prose, when a writer does that really demands that we pay attention to it. All right, so moving to Woman Hollering Creek and other stories, as I mentioned, there are three sections in this of in the collection. And it's really interesting uh, from a reader's perspective to think about how she organizes them. She's dealing with many of the same themes, but much more about romance, heartache, sexuality and sex. So as I said, the last part especially has very um, much, very many stories that speak to um, a mature sense of sexuality that you'll have to consider what is appropriate for your classroom and how students will respond to this. But they're really powerful stories. Sometimes if you get students that have only seen the, read The House on Manga Street, they get to these or they get to the poetry and they're really confused by it. So you need to think about how you would prepare to teach them some of those stories, all right? So I don't think I'm gonna have time to show this, but I'll put the link to it. The story 11, which is one of my favorite stories here about 
a little girl on her 11th birthday, sort of in that moment between being a child and being a grown up, um, is beautifully read by Cisneros in this particular um, library reading. Um, I'm not always sure if the link I've set in the PowerPoint um, works, but I will put it in the chat later on because I have it set up um, to hear her read. I mean, I think it's always great to hear an author reading her text. And there is available a audiobook of Cisneros reading House on Manga Street. She has a really interesting voice. And again, sometimes that's surprising to students. She talks about her voice being almost childlike, but I think it helps us consider the author's perspective and how she sees how a story might be read within the text. All right, so we're getting back to that question of why write? And this is how I sort of started our discussion. And I wanted to come back to something in the 25th anniversary edition of um, the introduction to the 25th anniversary edition. She speaks a lot about her time in graduate school, her time trying to be a writer, and thinking about a writer as someone who spent all her time or his time making art and removed from the world. And that was really hard for her to do because she was a teacher, she was a counselor, she was working with students that were troubled, that had very different life experiences that she had. She's writing like the characters she met, I mean, she's teaching the characters that she has in the house in Manga Street. So what does she do with all of that? And she asked these big questions. How can art make a difference in the world? This was never asked at Iowa. This is where she did her grad work at the Iowa Writers Workshop. Should she be teaching these students to write poetry when they know how to defend themselves from someone beating them up? To Think about that question about how art can make a difference in the world. Uh, what C. Snettles comes to is she can make that difference both through the text that she writes, like Mongo Street, and through the outreach that she does. So at the end of the novel, in the last chapter, Mongo says goodbye, she speaks about the role of the writer and the writer's relationship to the world. One day I will pack my bags of books and paper, one day I will say goodbye to Mongo. I'm too strong for her to keep me here forever. One day I will go away. Friends and neighbors will say, what happened Esperanza? Where did she go with all those books and paper? Why did she march so far away? They will not know I have gone away to come back for the ones I left behind, for the ones we cannot out. So in those last paragraphs of the novel, she comes back to the idea that she will leave this place, she will go away, but that as the message has been given to her throughout the novel, she has not only a responsibility to come back, but a desire to come back and to make those changes. In a chapter called Alicia and I Sitting on the Steps, our character Esperanza is speaking with a friend about how she hates this place, how she hates her home, the street, and someone should do something. And Alicia says, well, who's gonna do something? The mayor? And that cracks her up because of course, she's never seen the institutions come in to change things. And it speaks much to the responsibility of the writer, of the artist, of the individuals within the society to be the place where change has to happen. And that doesn't mean that institutions don't have responsibility for it as well, but she recognizes how important it is to come from inside in both herself and her text. And to me, that's what she's doing with how art can make a difference in the world. So that's always been really powerful to me in all of Cease Notice's texts and something that I've, I've come to appreciate and then I bring into my classroom. Um, to let you know, Cease Notice is a writer who often um, dips her toe and then splashes wholeheartedly into controversy. And so um, I wanted to end this with something that happened in the last year um, with the publication of a book called American Dirt. So if you're not familiar with the controversy of this novel, um, it's set in Mexico, 
and it deals with um, a wealthy woman in Mexico who undergoes much misfortune and decides that she needs to uh, come to the U.S. And so it, she, this is a way of exploring the immigration process and the immigration questions that we have right now. Uh, but um, when Cummins, when the book was published, um, it was published to great fanfare. It was an Oprah pick, but and Cisneros, along with a few other uh, writers such as Julio Alvarez, um, came out in support of the book. They were blurbed on the back. But when the book was released, there were critiques of the book, not only for its portrayal, uh, which some argued are too stereotypical of life in Mexico, life of the immigrant, but also because um, Cummings is not Mexican-American. And even though she never represented herself as Mexican-American, um, it seemed to be embracing a uh, persona. She talks about her Puerto Rican heritage and she talks about her husband's immigration status. But the arguments and the debate was about not only who gets to tell these stories, but how do they tell it? And so it brought a lot of attention and Cisnero stood by her support of the novel um, saying that while she didn't tell the story as she would tell the story. She felt that it was a way of giving attention to the stories of the border. Sort of the response by other writers would be, well, why not let those that are on the border tell their own story? And publishers listened, Oprah listened. She had you know, a whole series talk, um, special where she talked with uh, Mexican and Mexican American writers about representation, but it spoke very much to the bigger issues in the publishing industry about representation. So for us as teachers, I think this is a moment to consider how we bring this into this classroom. How do we bring in diverse authors? How do we make it not just and now it's time for the diversity aspect of our class, but to think about how diverse authors needs to be a part of American literature, of Texas literature, of the literature that we bring to the classroom and speak to our own st students' diverse experience. To me, the flip side of the why write story is the, the why read story, right? We need to be able to present texts that our students can respond to. In my experiences, Cisneros' texts do that in ways that allow us to work through those teaks to think about craft, but also to think about the bigger theme issues of why is it that literature matters in this world? So I know that was fast and that was a, a quick review of her works and ways to teach it, but I, I hope that gives you a place to start in considering how to bring Cisneros into your class. And if you do teach already, I'd love to hear some of the things that you do with her as well. So, um, quick thing for further reading, some short stories that your students might like, uh, Americans and Mexico Next Right. Americans is a great story about um, a main character, very much like Esperanza and her brothers who are visiting the, their awful grandmother, that's her nickname, in Mexico City and where she fits in with that. Never Marry Mexican is one of those fabulous stories that has an unreliable narrator that you're never sure how to trust her view of men and one man in particular. Poetry, uh, Peaches, Six and a Tinbo, very romantic poem, a nice one to build on imagery. And My Wicked Wicked Ways speaks to the ways that she's become a writer. For You, You Bring Out the Mexican in Me is a love poem. And essays, uh, all of these um, can be found in her collection, House of My Own. For students, Only Daughter uh, thinks about how she's the only daughter and has six bro older brothers. So what that means to grow up as the only girl in the house. And then for you, uh, the essay Hide Your House, which speaks to what it was like for her to write this novel. And then the one that I shared with you, the author responds to your letter. I, these are all texts I think that would make for enjoyable reading over the break, if you can just read for pleasure these days.
and then think about something to bring back to your classroom. All right.